Rising food costs, higher energy bills, record petrol prices, increasing inflation, and an end to furlough, and the universal credit uplift. Tonight, cost of living, what's got to give? This is The Great Debate. On The Great Debate, we get to the heart of the issue dominating the headlines. This week, as the Chancellor prepares to set out how he plans to run the country's finances in the months to come, how are people coping with pressures on their own budgets? And what, if anything, can Rishi Sunak do to solve the crisis? Our viewers panel, drawn from around the country and beyond, will share their views. They'll have their say, and they'll put their questions to our studio guests. Joining us in the studio this week, Lord Bird, founder of The Big Issue. Director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, Paul Johnson. Ella Whelan, journalist and co-convener of the Academy of Ideas Festival. And personal finance expert, Emmanuel Asukro. The big question facing them all tonight, cost of living. What's got to give? Let's go straight to the wall, to our viewers panel, and let's talk to Denise Brigginshaw in Essex. Denise, what's your take on this? Well, I was furloughed in the first lockdown, then I was made redundant. Then at Christmas, just gone, I um, was diagnosed with um, disabilities. I'm 54, I've paid in all my life, my taxes, I've got my degrees, they say about this up still, I've got all my degrees, but let's up to my name, but here I am on universal credit. And they've just taken the 20 pound a week off of me. Now, I've had to make a decision, so I'm not gonna put my heating on because they've just told me that's gonna go from 70 pound a month to 160. So I will now be wearing more jumpers. In fact, that's what I do. I've got blankets on my sofa um because i'm just too scared to put my heating on and it's just not the heating it's the electric as well and i just feel really frustrated because there isn't a choice i you know i'm stuck i've got chronic pain i'm i'm stuck at home i'm stuck on universal credit and i don't think the government's in the real world you know the people voted for the government they're supposed to, the, the people vote for them, they're supposed to work for us. Yeah, but I just feel they've completely abandoned the reality of what we go through. Thank you for that, Denise. A dose of reality there. Let's go to Stephen Fairley. Stephen, you're in Bathgate in uh, West Lothian. That's correct. Uh, good evening, panel. Um, my question is Is this government going to help bring the cost of living down, or are we on our own? Why, why are you asking that, Stephen? When you say on our own, what do you mean? Well, I just feel as if, you know, I think we are indeed on our own. I think the government needs to look at stripping back on existing policies to help on housing, energy, childcare, and the rising cost of food. Uh, inflation's on the, on the rise. Wages is, ri is rising, but not at a, it's a slower rate than inflation. And we've got labour shortages. And I think, from my own personal experience, I think we are indeed on our own. I think it's, there's, there's a big gap and uh, it's, it's sad to see, especially with the, the person who was just talking before me. You, well, in fact, Denise was saying that she just feels that nobody really understands. Is that your feeling too? Absolutely. I think um, the government, uh, even local councils, I mean, local councils uh, are given a lot of law. You know, they're given a lot of laws. Uh, they can pass um, taxations on the, you know, the, the, you know, the council taxes, and they're 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 not listening neither. So it's not just the government, but it's also the councils as well could okay. could step right. in and help people within their constituency. Stephen, thank you. Let's take your question and put it to our studio guests. Stephen asks, will the government bring down the cost of living? or are we on our own? John Bird. 
Well, I think the government has to bring down the, sta the cost of living. I think the... Uh, I mean, I talk to the government every now and then, and they keep saying they put an enormous amount of money in the emergency, and they're in some senses reply implying that they don't have the money for the recovery. So we have to look at this as a recovery period. So therefore, they have to carry on making the investment, because if they don't, then there will be an enormous hit on social services, on our schools, on our uh, NHS and all the other parts of society. Uh, and so, therefore, they have to spend to save. And that is a very, very difficult uh, thing to ask the government when they've spent over about half a trillion pounds mm on the emergency. We have to get through to the recovery. So our, our colleague there is exactly right. OK. Emmanuel Aluko, um, what are you hearing from your clients? Because you're a finance expert, they come to you for advice? Yep, they come to me for advice and they definitely feel like they're on their own. And, you know, we have to look at ways to try and make it work for them. I think for the average person, we've seen discounts on, on stamp duty for people that want to buy a house. We've seen, ben we've seen pensions now being able to pass without paying any tax. We've seen so, so, many, so much support for people who want to make money, but yet so much cuts when it comes to people who really need it most. And I feel that the government needs to definitely do more to help the poorest, and I feel they're more concerned about their votes than they are about the people they should really care about. So your point is really not just privation, as it were, but also unfairness. Unfairness, completely. They're, they're, they're targeting... Their, we've seen over the last 12 to 18 months the support and the help has gone to people who are making money as opposed to people who need the support. Paul Johnson, um, this is a world that you spend your life in. Do you recognise this picture? Yeah, I mean, we've had uh, big cuts in benefits over the last uh, four or five years. It's not just the failure to keep the £20 uplift in universal credit. The value of benefits has been cut by something like £12 billion over the last five or six years. So there's certainly been a push down on the incomes of people right at the bottom of the distribution. That said, there's a lot more people in work than there were four or five years ago, and the minimum wage is rising quite fast. So there is some offsetting impact there. What we're seeing right now, of course, is a, a push-up in prices that we haven't seen actually for really quite a long time, with inflation heading up towards 4 or even 5%. Now, that's not the levels some of us can remember in the 1970s of 20%, but that is still a big increase in costs. And to the extent that it's coming through things like fuel bills, which you heard about uh, just there, that has a much bigger effect on people on low incomes than it does on people on high income. So even if benefits mm. go up in line with inflation, that's still not going to be enough to make up for that additional cost for people who are on benefits. Ella Whelan, what, what do you make of it? Is the government not doing enough? Or... Well, they seem to be playing two games at the same time that are contradicting one another. So, you know, whether it be the cut in the £20 for universal credit or the end of the furlough scheme, the message seems to be from the government that we're coming out of this pandemic. And as John says, you know, all emergency measures are now to be relinquished. Uh, that's, the, that's sort of what they're suggesting. But at the same time, we've got this sword of Damocles held over our head in the form of Plan B. We've got now suggestion of future, if not <coughs> lockdown, some kind of restriction, which tells everyone at home watching, oh, well, I better get ready for another experience of what we've had in the last 18 months, which means, as Denise was talking about, redundancies, changes in people's ability to access, you know, the finer things in life, not just the basics, but actually have some leisure time, do something nice with your life and, you know, enjoy life. And they can't keep playing that double game. It seems at the moment that the government wants to pretend like they're um, doing something, but holding this threat over us of increased COVID restrictions, which we know are devastating for people's standards of living. All right, let me come back to the war. Let's, cut, let me, let's talk to Wayne Taylor. Wayne, uh, you're a customer support advisor, and I think you're in Bradford. What do you make of this question about whether the government is doing enough, leaving us alone? What do you think? Um, to, to answer your actual initial question of what the um, programme's based on, what's going to give, um, it's that, well, it's me. But I'm going to give um, because I do not think the government ever does enough. I think the government that are there, they always look after themselves. They will always fill their own pockets with what they want. And they do not, I don't think any government, whether it's Conservative or Labour, 
actually cares about the average man. Myself, Trevor, I am not an average guy on the street. I earn a good living, I have a, I have a good wage, and I love the finer things in life. But this past two to three weeks, I am now, when I go shopping, I am picking um, off the shelf. I've got to check what I'm buying. And it's just, I, <laughs> I spent £95 this week on a shop, and that was literally for food to make the meals. I weren't, I didn't get any, <laughs> like, the likes of biscuits, the like, nice things that you want to be able to pick and what have you. And on petrol, 12 months ago, it cost me £48 to fill my car. I went to fill up on Sunday, and it cost me £65 to fill my car. That's in 12 months. That is a £17 rise, and that's just shocking. OK, Wayne, you are clearly feeling the squeeze. Let's see how widely that view is reflected. Let's go to the wall. Uh, let's talk to our viewers' panel. And I'm going to ask you all where you are on this. Those who think that we are now getting to the place where the squeeze is so extreme, government has to do something. We expect something from Mrs Sunak on Wednesday. Who thinks that the squeeze has got to the extreme place? Um, those who agree that it's gone too far. Looking at what your, the situation is today, hearing what you're hearing today, who thinks that between now and April, national insurance uh, uh, rise kicks in, who thinks that they are going to have to make some actual changes to their spending patterns and what they do between now and April? Those who think they're going to have to make a change. OK, well, I think that's a pretty clear signal to the Chancellor that right now the country thinks that something dramatic is going to have to, to give. Emmanuel, is that... Do you, what do you think people can do about this? Oh, it's a hard question, because everyone's finances is personal to them, and I think we have to reassess. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to clients and saying, you know, we're coming up to Christmas, we've got... We can't see this Christmas as we've seen other years. We have to look at cutting back, maybe look at a 30% reduction, really look at what's really important. I think we have to... We're going to have to make changes. We can't live how we lived before, because we haven't experienced this type of climate, this type of environment before. And so changes have to be done. And it's hard, because, especially after the year we've had, and, and the people, the loved ones that we've lost, Christmas, you really want to go out and you really want to enjoy it. But I, I just feel like that this is not the year to do that. Uh, Paul Johnson, do you think this is a temporary blip or are we going to have to get used to the whole belt tightening thing? Well, we've sort of got used to it in the last 10 years and more. Don't forget, the last 10 years have seen the slowest growth in income and earnings that probably we've had in 200 years. So there's a sense in which this isn't terribly new. What, what, what The bit that is new about this is that its price is going up. Rather, what we've seen over the past decade is prices going up a little bit and wages going up um, about the same rate, but, but really slow growth. We, up until 2010, we got used to getting better off year after year after year, and that sort of stopped for the last decade. So in that sense, it isn't that new, but it is different because we're seeing price of fuel, price of petrol, uh, price of um, food and so on going up. For some people... Um, let, let's be clear, for some people, this is going to be a great year or two because we're some bits of the labour market, some people on earnings are seeing, genuinely seeing quite big uh, increases. Uh, but in other areas, they're not, and the, and the labour market's really struggling. And I think that's one of the things that the Chancellor's going to be wrestling with and we all need to acknowledge. As Emmanuel was saying, everyone's different and um, circumstances are different, but actually it's more different at the moment because the economy's adjusting to COVID, it's adjusting to Brexit, the big changes, which normally take several years, are happening over a few months. OK, so something real is happening, and we are going to have to work out what to do about it. We've been talking about the cost of living crisis, but is it being felt equally across the generations? That's coming up next. Welcome back to The Great Debate, where we're discussing the cost of living and asking what's got to give. And it's not just what's got to give, but who. I'd like to start with Ron Knox, who is in Sutton, in Surrey. Hello, Ron. Good evening, Trevor. Good evening, panel. It's a time when the cost of living is rising 
at an unbelievable rate, particularly in staples like food and energy. The government's answer seems to be to promise high wage growth for everyone, although details about how that might be achieved are very sketchy. My question is, is the suspension of a triple lock a betrayal of pensioners? Uh, but that's quite an important question. I want to come in to you guys and ask you Ron's question. Is the suspension of the triple lock a betrayal of pensioners? Um, Paul, what uh, do you think? Uh, no, um, would be my straightforward answer to that on this particular occasion. Um, the headline rate of earnings this year went up something like 7 or 8% just because there was a huge dip last year. So if you'd kept to the triple lock, you'd have given pensioners vastly more than anyone else in the population was getting. Uh, and just because of a statistical anomaly about the way these things are measured. So certainly for this year to revert to the higher of inflation and 2.5% was quite appropriate. Arguably over the longer term, there's two ways you can look at this. What the triple lock does is gradually ratchet up the level of the state pension relative to prices and earnings, and that might be something you want to do, though the triple lock is a pretty random way of doing it. But to have kept it this year and had a huge windfall for pensioners, um, simply because of a statistical artefact, uh, would, in my view, actually have been absurd. OK, well, I want to reassure viewers that though I am myself a pensioner, I am completely neutral here. But let me come back <laughs> to you, Ron. What, what do you think about uh, Paul's answer, that actually it would have been really unfair People like you and me would have got, what, an 8% 8, 8 rise? Yeah. What do you think? The point, the point th in my understanding, the point of the triple lock was to guarantee that the, this vital state benefit would continue to rise every year. And, you know, the three measures of the triple lock, uh, inflation, average earnings growth, or a flat 2.5% rise, pensioners were promised that the highest of those three measures would be implemented. And I would only say that it's also very poor politics. I mean, the elderly form a big percentage of Conservative voters and probably those who voted for Brexit. So Boris Johnson needs to be very careful. I am sure he is listening right now, Ron, and he has, he has taken your point. Let, let's, let's see what a younger voter thinks about this. I'm going to come to uh, Farah Khan uh, in Crawley in West Sussex. Um, Farah, I think you will have heard what Ron had to say. What do you think? Do you buy it? Do you accept his point? I think that um, everyone in society is equally important. Um, but I also believe that the government needs to do more and remember that tomorrow is in their hands today. I think that the government should look at the future, which are young people. And this means that I think um, this we can reduce tuition fees. We should be, re be reducing commuting costs and focusing on levelling up policy and supply side policy on education so that spaces can be created for young people to excel professionally. OK, I'm going to ask you two to try and persuade each other. But before we come to that, Emmanuel, where do you stand on this? Do you think that we are coddling the old folks, moi, uh, at the expense of the future? Um, I do. I do think we are. I think that when you think about... You're off the show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think, when you think about what young people have had to go through in regards to... I, I meet young people every day who, can't, who struggle to even dream of owning a property with what, what's happened over time. We see the cost of university compared to... When we, when we start to actually look at what, what young people have to go through compared to what other generations have gone through, I think, you know, we have to try and have more policies to really encourage them, to give them the hope, to give them an idea that they can actually own something, they can have ownership of their lives. And I feel right now we're, we're, that's not the case. I feel a lot of young people right now just feel they have to go with the flow and wherever they can take. And maybe that's just because of the current climate, but I think the government really needs to okay. give people their identity. Ella? Well, listen, I'm not quite young anymore, but uh, I think that the, you know, maybe speaking on behalf of the younger section, there is, I th we have to reject this generational, very toxic way of framing a generational war in politics, particularly when it comes to 
provisions for people in society. I mean, I have to disagree with the idea that it's young people that have been hit worse throughout the pandemic. I mean, we're talking in a political context in which um, elderly people have been for years now denigrated, whether it be talks of uh, describing them as bed blockers about, in relation to the NHS, you know, the suggestion that your granny needs to downsize from her house that she's had from, you know, 30, 40 years to be able to make room for yeah. a younger generation. Ron, uh, I, I could see you smiling as Ella was speaking and it sort of feels like you agree. Persuade Farah. Talk to Farah and persuade her. I, I totally accept Farah's point that uh, young people's development is, is key to, to the economy. However, um, people who have worked all their lives and built up considerable amount of, um, you know, uh, um, financial resource and so on, are now finding that things are getting very tough and it just simply isn't deserved. Um, the the um, average age is, is getting higher, isn't it? And okay. it's going to be um, okay. a, a question that won't go away. It's going to be in increasing in volume, you okay. know, forevermore. All right, Farah, persuade Ron that he is basically... Uh, making a case that is unfair on young people? Well, if we look at what the pandemic did to young people, we can clearly see that um, a lot is wrong with the current system. And um, we need to just look at um, the fact that young people are not at university, but we're, we're still paying their full university fee. We just need to look at how um, young people are treated fiscally when it comes to commuting prices. Why are they so high? Young people don't have that money. I think we need to understand that everyone in society is valid um, to receive help if they need it. But I think we have to focus on um, if the government is serious about creating and maintaining a, a high skill economy, we need to work on creating that and that should start now. Um, I, yeah, I really think that we all need to focus on everyone within society, but okay. we should be prioritising young people as well. OK, thank you both very much. Let me, let's come to the wall. Let's, let's accept that, uh, you know, we could be thinking about growth, but the truth is that Mr Sunak will tell us on Wednesday that there is no magic money tree, there's limitations, and Ron Knox says that actually a promise is being broken and that actually he should stick to his the promise. Those who agree with Ron Knox that actually the triple lock should stay in place as it was promised. OK. There's not a lot of hands there. Who think that actually that there's a few people, there's quite a, about 20%, 25%. Those who think that actually uh, what Emmanuel and Farah have been saying is, uh, and that uh, Paul Johnson said, that actually it's time to make a change. Who, who agrees with them? I think a few, a few more hands. I, I think most people want to leave this one to Mr Sunak, but we'll see what he says. Next, will more money for the NHS mean less cash for other public services? The cost of living, what's got to give? That's our topic on the great debate. The Chancellor will announce a £6 billion count, cash injection for the NHS this week to provide millions more checks, scans and procedures. But Rishi Sunak is facing calls for even more money for health with waiting lists at a record high and tens of thousands of COVID-19 cases reported every single day. We'll hear from our viewers' panel on this in a moment, but first... I'm joined by Professor John Appleby, Director of Research and Chief Economist at the independent health think tank, think tank the Nuffield Trust. Uh, John, is the money that we hear that the Chancellor is going to shower on the NHS enough? Ooh, that's a very big question. Well, uh, just the six billion refers to uh, capital money. Uh, the NHS over the last few years has been spending about uh, seven or eight billion a year on capital, 
We don't know quite whether he's just carved up that money into um, some specific things to do with diagnostics and so on. Whether it'll be enough, that's a big open question. Um, uh, it's a, the choice is ours in a sense. Uh, how much do we want to spend? Um, we could spend all of our wealth on healthcare at some level. Um, so, but that means less spending on other things. So I think the question is open. Is there any limit to how much money we can pour into the NHS? I mean, some people would say that what's happening now is it's just sucking money in. Well, um, at the moment, we spend about uh, one-tenth of our entire GDP on healthcare. That's public and private. About, very roughly, seven and a half, eight percent of GDP is on the NHS, and the rest is is private healthcare, including things, you know, buying pills from Boots and so on. Um, that, that's, a, that's a large amount of money. Uh, it's not out of line with other countries. We're about middle of the pack for our EU colleagues, uh, EU neighbours. Um, the US is a bit of an outlier with about almost verging on 20% of, of its GDP on healthcare. So, um, yes, it does suck in money. Um, we keep inventing new things to do to people, and uh, healthcare spending is one of the sort of spending preferences as we get richer, yeah. along with education. I, I think, I personally, I think we're some way off uh, where we'll end up, as it were, in terms of spending on healthcare. I can certainly foresee us spending uh, up, easily up to twenty percent on healthcare wow. of our of our national wealth. And. Do you think that we could use that money elsewhere, or is it just just a way of things? Well, you, you ask an economist, uh, you know, show me a benefit, I'll show you a cost, as it were. There's always a trade-off here, so we could spend that money on other things. Um, you know, uh, we could spend much more money on education in this country. Um, I mean, it's a very, it's a very tricky thing with public spending. Who's making the decisions here? So, you know, it, we wouldn't be having this conversation about coffee. We don't have a minister of coffee who's setting a budget <laughs> for how much we spend on coffee. But because it's public money and we gather taxes, somebody somewhere in the system, i.e., the government, has to make a decision about the next three, four years about how much we spend on healthcare. So we have to think about these things, and they're very, they're very hard okay. things to think about in terms of, you know, the trade-offs that we'll have to make. Okay, John, um, thank you so much for that, making making it so clear. That's really helpful. Now, we have an economist in the studio, but I'm come to, going to come to him after going to our viewers' panel. And I am going to ask Alan Reevey. Uh, Alan, what are your thoughts on this question? The amount that we spend on the NHS? Well, it's uh, probably starving the other um, public sector services, like education, as we've just heard. Uh, the development of infrastructure and policing is something which is certainly needs looked at. Um, so the, the health service seems to be just a bottomless pit and uh, there's just no, no plug in it. Um, I think the pandemic um, brought a lot of things to light. We had no PPE. We didn't have the money for PPE. Then these Nightingale hospitals just suddenly sprung up. Mm -hmm. So I think it's possibly a management, uh, management of money issue. And uh, that's Richie Sunak. OK, and you've got a question that comes out of that for our studio. Is the NHS responsible for starving the other public sector services of funding? OK, let's come back to studio. Alan asks, is the NHS responsible for starving other public sector services of funding? Well, we have the person, the perfect person to answer that question, Paul Johnson. Well, public uh, spending on public services is, in the end, down to government. So the NHS could cost all that it does at the moment and we could have more money for other public services if government and electorate were willing to have higher taxes and spend more on other things. But the thing about the NHS is that it takes about £4 in every 10 of spending on public services at the moment. Uh, that's up from considerably less than £3 in every 10 
just 20 years ago. So it's becoming a bigger and bigger part of everything that government does. And that's partly because um, when spending's going up, spending on health goes up faster than everything else. And, of course, in the austerity years, spending on everything else went down while spending on health continued to rise. We have a cho Just to make that point yet again, we have a choice about how much of that money goes on health, how much it goes on other things, and how much we're willing to pay for it. Now, very often people say, look, very often in the UK we, 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 we want European standards of public services with American levels of tax. Well, you can't have that. You either have European public services and European tax, and yes, they do typically. have... Which is typically considerably more than here, so that higher taxes and more money on public services. Or we can decide to be a low-tax economy, but if we're a low-tax economy, we're also going to get low public services. OK. John Bird, you're a legislator? I'm not... Well, I'm in the House of Lords and I look at the government's um, legislation, but I'm not in the government. I think the whole argument has been skewed, and it's been skewed for a considerable period of time. In 2010, the, uh, the austerity government, the coalition government, decided to cut all sorts of parts of, of the apparatus, supplying the money that they gave local authorities. They were looking to save 7 to 9 per cent. They end up saving 1 and 1.5 per cent. But the damage they did to this country led the National Health Service to become the biggest social sponge that's ever, ever been created. We have got a situation because of the lack of educational uh, investment in education, the lack of investment in, in a high-wage economy, the lack of uh, ed, money around social services. It's what it has. You've turned the National Health Service into a social sponge to soak up all of the problems that have been left by the government's cutting austerity. Okay. So if you really want... If we really want to do something, we need to reform the National Health Service so it doesn't have to pick up the tab for poverty because people going into the National Health Service are people often who are there because of poverty. I'm going to come back to our viewers and I want to talk to Gareth Kearns in Bromley. Gareth, I think I... you have a, a view about the spending on the NHS. Yeah, uh, we can't afford to do without it because it is big, it is big. It is therefore able to mobilise economies of scale, which means it gets really good value for money. It gets things cheaper, drugs, etc. cetera, it gets things cheaper. Compare it to America, it does it cheaper. And if you compare it to America, it actually produces better results on just about every level, apart from perhaps, I think, cancer recovery. I think cancer recovery, Americans are doing something better. But on just about every other outcome, we do better and we do better for less money, we're not paying dividends, and we'd get those economies of scale. <clears throat> OK, Gareth. Ella, do you buy Gareth's argument? Well, that, that we, you know, all the, the doing down of the NHS, which I agree with in a lot of ways in terms of it has become, as and John says, a bit of a sponge. You know, we forget that the idea of a social and collective provision of healthcare for everyone free at the point of entry is a is a thing that I politically believe in and that many people believe in. Mm. Um, it's something to be proud of. But the, one of the questions is, you know, be forgiven for thinking that the NHS was swimming in money because of all the cash that's been thrown at it. And you look and see that the, there's a crisis in wages. Or, um, cleaners, who we've shown throughout the pandemic, provide a, they get overlooked a lot, but provide one of the most basic and important roles for how a hospital runs properly. Of nurses, of midwives, I mean, uh, something that I know a little bit about, fertility care for women in this country is abysmal. It's, you know, a postcode lottery, like many services. Emmanuel, should the NHS get more money without extensive reform? Um, no. Simple answer. I think it is it's more about efficiencies. I think we have to look at the policies behind it, where the money's going, what's being done. I don't think there's enough accountability. Money just gets spent and I don't feel people are held accountable and there's no, OK, we made this mistake, let's not do it again. It seems like it repeats itself year on year. And until we start to actually have efficiencies where they actually publish where this money's going, who's accountable, what changes are going to be done to ensure that they're going to look after the money and resources that they're given, I don't think we should be pouring any more into it. After the break, more money for the lowest earners. But who's going to pay for it? Welcome back. What's got to give to help the cost of living 
and what can the Chancellor do about it in the budget? That's the topic of tonight's great debate. On Wednesday, Rishi Sunak will confirm an increase to the national living wage of more than 6%. While there could also be an end to the freeze of public sector wages. There's no doubt that both of those things could help families struggling with food, petrol and energy prices. But how can the government and businesses pay for it? We're joined now by Tony Earnshaw in Newcastle. Tony, you have a business. Uh, what's your answer? How are you going to deal with this? Well, good evening. We've been in business now for nearly 18 years and... Um, we know that prices generally increase every year. We build into our contracts a 3% increase year on year. But as you just said, this year, the increase just on wages alone could be or is 6.6%. Um, many businesses out there are still trying to bounce back from the pandemic. If businesses have been closed for many months, um, nearly the whole of the whole of half of 2020, um, sort of to put the onus on businesses and to expect them to be able to put wages up so significantly at such, at such short notice um, is quite a burden. So, Tony, what, um, what happens? Do you just lose people? Well, there's already such shortage. We know that. Um, we know that some businesses can't even reopen, they can't run the kitchens. We know that by, putting, um, by, by, by the wages going up, that also increases inflation now. We're all going to pay for this, whether it's a glass of wine, whether it's okay. food we order, whether it's fuel. I mean, I have a fleet of um, just under 50 vehicles and the fuel prices have gone through the roof. All right. So, I mean, to me, it's just a smoke screen. They're putting up the wages, the government, and in turn, taxes go up. Okay. It's a way to put up taxes okay. with, without Tony, us, basically. Tony, I think you have a question for our studio. Yeah, question is, can businesses really afford to increase wages after the COVID pandemic. Tony Earnshaw, Newcastle, asks, can businesses really afford to increase wages after the COVID-19 pandemic? Emmanuel. Um, a lot of my business clients are struggling. They are trying to, to get back. And I think what happens, as, as said, was that now they're going to have to increase prices. If they, if they increase wages, they're going to have to keep increase prices, which then in turn increases inflation. So I think we have to be careful when we, when we put that pressure, especially after what we've been through, to then put an additional burden on, on businesses with, with such short notice. OK. Ella, what do you think? Well, I mean, we've been talking a lot, understandably, about the pandemic and its effects, but we have to remember that the issue of particularly productivity in this country has been, uh, has been dire for, I think actually Paul mentioned it, has been dire for decades now. And there is no quick fix magic pill to this. I mean, a few more pennies in people's pockets in relation to raising the living wages welcome if, you know, as people are in dire strains. But it's certainly not the solution. I think we have to flip this and start talking about how we promote, you know, it's been a relative negative discussion about how we manage with less and instead we should be talking about how we promote growth how we promote wealth you in the context of a government that's obsessed with cutting and tightening its belt not just in relation to benefits or taxes or things like that but also with the kind of green agenda that says that growth and development is a bad thing that people having more um, is a is a negative thing it says we made a virtue of the fact that we should be having less consuming less and so that in that context is it any wonder why people are so hostile Hostile to the and in particular businesses are so hostile to the idea of taking a bit of a risk. I mean, I know it's difficult okay. to talk about risk post pandemic, but we have there has to be some addressing of the longer term issues of the of productivity in this country rather than playing around with a few pennies here or there. Okay, uh, I'm going to come to Robin Gillingham in Devon. Ella says that we should be talking about growth and so on, but uh, Robin, what's your view about the, uh, about this? Are we being too gloomy or? What do you think we should be talking about? Um, basically, we're, we're finding that we've got a, a small business, grassroots level, uh, the costs across the board are just keep rising annually. Uh, the only thing we can do now is pass that cost on to the end user. Um, you know, we have absorbed as much as we can. Margins are really tight. There's only so much you can do. So it's literally just got to be passed on. Don't want to, but that's the only way you can survive. And then you're having to compete with these large corporations that probably have a much better budget that can then afford to pay better wages than probably what the little small places can. 
and then you're having to compete against them as well to try and remain competitive. And so it's really tricky, it's a fine balance. So is it your view that the Chancellor is wrong to raise the living wage uh, so sharply? I don't think he has much choice. I think an external influence has caused all of this. So all this inflation, you have to. It's just a case of keeping up. And all we're doing is treading water. And so we're passing that cost on. Hopefully their wages have gone up slightly so they can afford it. Becomes just a bit relative. OK. Paul Johnson, are we heading for an inflation burst? Well, the increase in the minimum wage up till now have been incredibly successful. It's gone up an awful lot over the last 10 years, and that doesn't appear to have caused any problems with prices or unemployment. But going forward, there's a limit to this. And I think one of the real worries is it seems to be the only tool the government has at the moment. It's worried about people's uh, earnings, it's worried about productivity, and the main policy it appears to have is just to keep on putting the national living wage up. And at some point, as you've heard from a couple of your panellists, that's going to cause... Uh, that's going to cause real problems. In terms of its impact on inflation, what really matters, and I mean, just to repeat the point, I suppose, is wages going up with productivity going up. In other words, if we're paying people more because they're doing more, that's fine. That won't impact inflation. But if you keep pushing wages up when productivity isn't going up, then that will, in the end, just result in higher prices. And that, I think, is the worry across the board at the moment. John Bird, last, last word. You've spent a, a lifetime worrying about the least fortunate in society. What does this mean for them? Well, the interesting thing about our economy, which for since the time of the Victorians has been a low-wage economy, and if you have a low-wage economy, then you have people who, when something like the price of gas goes up, really hits them. And I think the government, what the government is trying to do is move people more to a higher wage economy. Mm -hmm. Now, at some stage, if we want to have more social opportunity and more egalitarianism, then we do need to move to a higher wage economy. A higher wage economy that is, as Paul says, linked to higher pro productivity. There is a joke that goes around that if you pay very, very low wages, then you will get very, very low uh, delivery. And we have to move into a high-wage economy. In my opinion, I think the government should be the one that picks up this gap mm -hmm. because it's the government's responsibility to lift us out of this hundreds of years of low-wage economy. OK, thank you. Let's just come back finally to the wall to our viewers panel. I guess go back to, I suppose, the central question. Let's give the Chancellor some advice. Uh, he hasn't uh, actually said, we haven't heard it from his mouth, that he's going to raise this national living wage, so we're pretty sure that's what's going to happen. Is he right? Let's say, who amongst our viewers' panel think that it is right and we can afford that 6.6% increase? Can I see those in who think it is right and we should afford it? Well, we're pretty clear. We think he can and we should. OK, that's it from us for tonight. I just want to say thank you to our panellists in the studio, Paul Johnson, Emmanuel Asuko, Ella Whelan and John Bird. And I want to thank you all on the wall for your questions, for your comments and your lively presence. We can see you. So thank you. Wave goodnight to our viewers. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of you who've been watching at home. We'll see you again for next week's Great Debate. <laughs>